Good evening, all. Welcome to Conversations That Count. Thank you for joining us this weekday evening. I am Shreeli Kapale, Fairfax GOP Vice Chair of Strategy and Engagement. Our goal through this program, Conversations That Count, is to bring in candidates during primaries that uh, so you get to know them better and learn about the issues that you care about and they care about. So in order to do that, uh, as you know, I bring in candidates each week. This week we have Matthew Chapel. Uh, he's running for eight. Uh, I'm sorry, he's running for 11th congressional district. He's here to address challenges facing our communities, provide solutions to the issues that we all talk about in the community inspire change. I've known Matt for a while and I've heard him speak about the issues eloquently so hopefully we can get a solid discussion going here. As the Republican Party of Congressional Primaries are coming up this month, I encourage all of you to get to know our candidates. Matthew Chappell is running for 11th Congressional District. He's a proud veteran who worked in counterintelligence and served in Iraq and Afghanistan. He has also worked as a police officer and as a national security advisor with the Department of Defense. Matt has seen the challenges facing our country, our community, and he wants to continue his service to our county and country by representing us in Congress. Matt, welcome to Conversations That Count. Thank you for having me. And yes, it's been great to get to know you and everybody else um, with the Fairfax GOP the past few months. It's been a, a wonderful experience for me and my family. Thank you, Matt. You have a beautiful family. I can tell you that. Thank you. Matt, after high school, I see that you enlisted in the U.S. Army as an infantryman. At just 18 years old, uh, you went on to your first deployment to Iraq as part of Operation Iraqi Freedom. Talk to us about journey from infantryman to working in counterintelligence. That's a pretty big move. So I actually joined during my junior year of high school when I was just 17. I had to get my mom and dad both to sign for that. And I can tell you my mom wasn't too happy about it at first. She's like, no, my son's not going into the infantry. But what happened is my best friend Reese and I were, uh, we were sitting on, on our computer back in the day. It was dial up, of course, real slow. And we were watching YouTube videos and we came across some videos of American troops that were captive. And I, I remember very, very clearly some um, troops from Nepal also that were captive and they were, they were brutally executed by the Al Qaeda Taliban regime, and it it made me so mad. Um, I remember the day I was sitting in in school, and I watched the towers fall, and that made me mad. And I wanted to join the army. And then just sitting here watching those videos, it was like that was it for me. All right, so I said, "Reese, get in the car." We had a little 2000 Chevy Cavalier, and we we drove up to our local recruiter, and both of us were like, "We want to join right now." And we'd already taken the ASVAB at high school, had pretty good scores, and my recruiter, Staff Sergeant Figueroa, I'll never forget. He's like, well, you can do anything you want. What do you want to do? I said, well, I want to join the infantry. Why do you want to join the infantry? Because I want to go fight America's enemies. I want to get revenge for my people, for my country. And <clears throat> the, the rest is history. I joined. I went to basic training after my, my junior year of school and went back for my senior year of school, went to my infantry school after that. And right after I graduated, I got orders and they were like, you're going to Iraq. It's like, oh, okay, cool. I'll go to Iraq. Neat. And uh, I, I still remember the, the day we landed in Kuwait and I, I stepped off the, the plane and got onto this bus and they dropped us off in this just this huge open field. And all I could see for miles was sand. And I'm like, well, I'm actually here. Um, it, was a, it was a little surreal. I didn't, I didn't know <laughs> what to think. I'm like, I, I'm, I'm here. I'm actually here. Wow, I'm doing it. And it was a, it was a great experience. I, I turned 19 while I was there and I, I lost a couple people, made lifelong friends. Um, at, the, at the age of 20, uh, I was diagnosed with PTSD. That's not necessarily a bragging point for anybody, but that's what war does to people. And I think there's a lot of people in Congress right now that are out of touch with that reality. And from there, I, uh, w when I was in Iraq, I met my wife on uh, Facebook, actually, through my sister. My sister was like, hey, you should talk to this, this girl. Her name's Jacqueline. We went to high school together. My sister's uh, about five years older than me. And uh, I, I started talking to Jacqueline to pass the time. We, we were lucky we didn't, in, in my time in the Army, we could do Facebook Messenger. We could do Skype. We didn't have to just write letters back and forth like vets before me did. So it was pretty easy. Um, Jacqueline's 
and I, uh, we, we built a really great relationship. It was so nice to have somebody to talk to after the missions. She would stay up past her hours. I'd stay up past my hours so we could communicate. And I told her, I was like, I know you, I know you're the woman I'm going to marry one day. And she, she laughed me off, but I got the final laugh because March 3rd of this year was our 10th year anniversary. And, uh, <laughs> When I got back, I decided I wanted to do something a little different with my with my life. Her her dad was always real hard on me. My dad was hard. They're like, "Hey, do something great. You've you've got so much potential." So I, so I looked into a way to a way to change my career path, and I found counterintelligence. So I interviewed for the position, had to go up and get boosted up to a top secret clearance and all of that. It was a, a pretty long process, but in the end, it was so worth it because after. After joining counterintelligence, I was able to go on three more trips to Afghanistan with uh, special operations forces. I've served with seventh special forces groups and JSOC teams and just the, the greatest experience of my life. The, these guys are amazing. They're so humble. They go, they go out there and they, I'll never, I'll never take credit for what Green Berets, Rangers, SEALs and all those guys do. I just, I merely got attached to them and got to see their greatness and how humble they are at their job. I just, it, it was such a humbling experience for me. And I've, I've told the story before. I, we, and we can move on to another thing also. I was, I know I'm, I'm going Absolutely. on. <laughs> Matt, the journey is so very interesting. I was just fascinated by how your professional and personal experiences or personal life came together. I mean, um, I don't belong to military or army family, but I have humongous respect. Uh, for what you all have accomplished. So Matt, let me ask you something. After your eight year tenure in the army, you also spent a few years as police officer in Georgia. And yes. during, the, during that tenure, uh, this is a two part question. During your tenure, it looks like you addressed issues such as domestic violence. Uh, and um, that's an issue that you personally have encountered is what my understanding was when I looked at your website. But um, uh, I think my question is domestic violence is one such issue that's not widely discussed in campaign trails. As a woman myself, um, I think uh, we need to talk about it. Uh, so I want to kind of understand why you kind of picked that as one of the issue, but also I did hear in one of the newspaper article that uh, your tenure as a police officer in Georgia was not uh, not very bright. So I, I really would like to kind of uh, talk about, um, I want you to tell us of what kind of those ac accusations were and uh, how are you kind of coming over it so you can definitely focus on yeah. your campaign because at the end of the day, we're all here to serve our communities. Of course, of course. And I'll, I'll address the, the last part first. The this, if you want to call it the great scandal of 2022 for Matthew Chappell. Uh, I, I saw the AJC article as well. I talked to that reporter and the, the claims made against me are completely false. We did release a statement. I, I'm happy to, to speak on a couple of the parts of the statement. I don't want to take up too much time with the whole statement, but if anybody watching wants that statement, my email is Matthew with two T's at chapel for congress.com. It's C-H-A-P-P-E-L-L -L for congress.com. And I'll gladly send you the statement. I have nothing to hide on this. Um, <clears throat> I, I want to reiterate, first and foremost, the accusations are absolutely false. I hate that my family's going through this. It's very stressful on me. It's very stressful on my wife. But we'll get through it as we get through it, anything. And I think the most important part to read out on this is I have a statement that's endorsed by several former and current law enforcement officers that I worked with. One's a captain, two are lieutenants. Um, two were field training officers. One was my field training officer. And then uh, in addition, since these are uh, not crimes, allegations that are um, alleging that I was essentially a womanizer behind the badge, which is not true. I had a, I had a woman um, officer that I worked with who was a field training officer speak up for me too. And I think it's real sad how the journalist went after her for that also for sticking up for me. She decided to, anybody who knows AJC knows it's a very progressive leftist hit article. Uh, and the, the female officer that went after me, she was called up and they insinuated that she's defending me because she had a relationship with me too. And that's just, you know, I thought, I thought the left didn't do the whole victim blaming thing, but apparently, apparently they do, which is pretty, pretty disgusting as well. Cause she's a great woman. She's uh, about 20 years older than me, which isn't a problem. I'm not, <laughs> not trying to say there's anything wrong with that, but she's been around my family a lot, taking care of my kids. So I just, I hate to see her go through that also. But the statement by these officers is pretty simple, and I'll read it from my phone. It says, 
The internal report about Matthew Chapel using the state crime database to follow a young woman home is completely false. Former GCPD Captain Tommy Tendale is a corrupt and untrustworthy individual with his own history of womanizing and covering up the serious misdeeds of his fellow officers that were his friends. And that's signed by those five to six officers who have great reputation in law enforcement. And, you know, AJC doesn't have to name their witnesses, so I, I don't have to name mine either. Um, and I, the only reason we're not putting them out there is to protect their, them from retaliation because that's the way it works, unfortunately. Sure, and sure, sure. if you look up Glen County Police right now, you're going to see, first and foremost, it's going to pop up as Jackie Johnson, Ahmaud Arbery. And these are issues I was very outspoken against. The Jackie Johnson, Chief Matt Doring, Lieutenant Corey Sasser, Captain Tommy Tendell regime is one of the most corrupt law enforcement regimes of all time. It's well known, well documented. And before this article was put out on me, the, the journalist was made aware that the new police chief, who I think is an outstanding person of great moral uh, compass, is, has reopened my file to potentially clear me from these things. I didn't have a chance to fight back myself because I was in Afghanistan. So they are like, hey, here's a hearing. You can come, you can fight back, you can defend yourself. Well, it's hard to do that from however many thousand miles away I was. <clears throat> so in the end, they threw stuff in a file and stamped off on it. And it's, it's not true, it's not due process. And I think that's one of the things with, as Republicans that we're all fighting for right now is due process, which is why one of my major um, platforms is to get rid of the Patriot Act because you've got Patriots right now locked up in, in the U.S. without due process, without a right to bail or anything like that. So fighting really hard for that. I'm hoping that this, the, the chief will blast everybody soon and be like, hey, look, Matthew was right all along. I think the article probably should have waited for that, but they didn't. And unfortunately, there's still people on our side and the Republican side that are continue to share this stuff and even blow it out of more proportion. I had an email forwarded to me a couple of days ago claiming that uh, I was under criminal investigation since I launched my campaign in February, which is completely false. And that campaign can expect a letter from our legal team within the next 24 hours for a cease and desist because quite frankly, I'm not under any criminal investigation whatsoever, never have been in my entire life. So to, to make things up about fellow Republicans like that is pretty despicable. But we can, we can move on from there. I'll address your other part. Um, <clears throat> Uh, you Thank you for clarifying, because we really appreciate you coming on and uh, clarifying our question. Yes, uh, I, I mean, again, I, I am somebody, uh, people call me task um, doer. I very, very much focus on tasks. I always say issues are very important to me, and I want to make sure we are focused on education, all the things that matter. So uh, domestic violence uh, is something that I've always thought that candidates need to look at it, because sometimes humanitarian causes are worth fighting for. So I would love to hear about your take on that. Yeah, of course. I, growing up um, under the age of three, I was I experienced domestic violence, and I still remember it vividly from how young I was. My mom and I were severely abused by my birth father. Um, it was it, it's just really unimaginable to put out there. I'm sure there's people watching right now that have experienced it because I want to say one in three or one in four women in their lifetime will experience domestic violence, which is unacceptable. And <clears throat> It's it shaped who I would become. It shaped why I wanted to be a law enforcement officer in the first place, why I wanted to fight against that, and why I backed the Second Amendment so firmly. Because if it weren't for the Second Amendment, my mom getting her hands on a little 38 special, I wouldn't be here talking to you. My mom wouldn't be teaching thousands of kids right now. She still hasn't retired because she loves it so much. We went from living in a trailer with mom working three jobs at different flea markets and everything to to a wonderful life. She she chased her dream of becoming a teacher. Uh, I remember the day the man I consider my father um, asked her to marry him. I think I was about five years old. He's a, He just retired as a law enforcement officer, and it was the happiest day of my life. I thought, you know what, my family's finally going to be whole. And uh, I, this, this man that he didn't have to care about me at all has come in, and he, he loves me. He loves my mom, and he wants, he wants to be my daddy. And that was that was amazing to me. So my, my parents are my, my heroes. I've always wanted to be like them. That's why, that's why I support the blue and support teachers 
so strongly, no matter what I experienced in law enforcement, 99% of it was still great, despite, you know, um, false allegations, the 1% of corrupt law enforcement I dealt with, that is not the majority of law enforcement. There are so many people, like the people that signed my endorsement and everything, that are so great, working so hard to protect women, to protect everybody else, that it's it's something I'm never gonna, I'm never gonna compromise on, something I always fight so, so hard for. But I always say when you pick issues based on your personal life, you have the passion for it. And I see the passion. So hopefully if you are the elected congressman, I hope uh, you do something about this. So <laughs> let's talk about Jerry Connolly, Matt. I feel I, I think that's uh, my favorite topic. Uh, I, I, I mean, uh, I am always shocked of what, uh, what are the things that he doesn't get away with. So Jerry Connolly, congressman, is serving his seventh term in the U.S. House of Representatives, and it blows my mind of how we keep electing the same people over and over again, expecting different results. So um, I, I'm sure you know this. Prior to his election, he also served 14 years on Fairfax County and serving five years. So obviously, you're running against a career politician here. So while we are talking about career politicians, Matt, the First Amendment right to free speech, press, assembly, and speaking even against the government, even if it is uh, a fair analysis of the government, they're all under attack every single day, especially about conservative. Sure. So we have, uh, I mean, we have group of politicians like Congress John, uh, Connolly, there are multiple, even eight congressional district, Don Byer has been sitting in a seat forever, who believe that they are rulers of this nation. I mean, that's just how it has become. So uh, I would like to hear from you, how will you remain or even become a voice for all of us that are living in like 11th congressional district? What will be your approach? Well, so I, I talked to a Fairfax County police officer is getting to retire, getting ready to retire soon. And he says that every officer on the force calls Connolly boss Connolly. So he, like you said, a ruler, the guy thinks he's just above everything and the greatest thing to ever walk the earth. A lot of times you hear from people, our politicians, career politicians, they're out of touch with the people. Absolutely true. You know, who's not out of touch with the people me because I'm paying $4,000 a month in rent, $3,600 a month in childcare, and the taxes they keep throwing on, the Biden inflation and everything, it's just, it's hitting my family hard. So I'm in touch. I never want to lose touch. I didn't get into this for money, fame, anything like that. I got into it because I was quite frankly pissed at the way that our country's headed. I've got three young kids in the school system. I've got another wow, how many more years of that do I have? About 15, I want to say, because I've got a three-year-old too. About 15 more years of putting kids through school. And I don't even want to be in politics by the time she graduates high school. I'm very four term limits. So I don't ever think that I'll get to the point. Well, I don't even want to say think. I know I'll never get to the point where I become that out of touch politician. I believe in term limits. I believe in getting in, working hard to fix the issues that you want to attack and moving on with your life and letting somebody else come in that's with the next generation more in tune to keep going. I'm not gonna turn into another Jerry Connolly. And he's, you can so easily tie him to every issue we have right now. Back in 06 or 08, he doubled the real estate tax in Fairfax County when he was working there. He showed his disregard for law enforcement with his, his different issues that have been in the news. We won't discuss them here. They're, I don't wanna be the next one to get a cease and desist letter like my campaign's about to send out. So we'll address him if he, if he has the uh, intestinal fortitude to get together for a debate, of course. But <clears throat> there's, there's a lot of things we can tie Connolly into. In the past 14 years, as a congressman, he's just been absent. He's been absolutely absent. He's absent on the education issues right now. It's, it's time for new blood. It's time to get him out of there and make him, make him uh, hold him accountable for what he's done and what he hasn't. I said he's having he's struggling to retire, so we're going to help him out there. Oh, we're going to help him definitely. <laughs> so, Matt, uh, I mean, I'm very much into data. I think that's one of my favorite thing. I um, so when I was talking uh, or even reviewing 11th congressional district, I realized that about 250,000 people were born outside of the country, like including me. I'm in 11th district. I'm a first generation immigrant. That's about 31.8 percent of congressional district. And um, I wouldn't say all by any means. I do have some friends that really enjoy the right to bear arms, but most of the constituents, uh, especially first generation immigrant, don't really like to support the candidate that supports the right to bear arms due to their 
experience in their native country and lack of understanding of why Second Amendment came into picture in the first place. Right. But the minute you understand the importance of Second Amendment, um, I'm sure even first generation Americans will be out there supporting the cause. Uh, um, have you had any unique experience in your life that led or inspired you to support this uh, right to bear arms? I mean, I'm glad you're taking up, but it's not particularly a, um, a popular thing to do, at least uh, among um, this 250,000 people that I'm talking about. Uh, so yeah. can you talk, if you do have anything that inspired you to kind of take that as an issue, show your strong support, which you do, I would love for you to talk about it. Uh, yeah. It you know, with, without going into too much detail because it's graphic, the, the very first incident was my mom using a small revolver, which sits in my safe next to my bed now because it's so it's so special to me. Using that to, um, to stop herself from being raped and stabbed. And I, I saw this. I saw it with my own two eyes. I saw my mom going through that. And she used the Second Amendment to defend herself and to defend me. And that is the single most important reason why I'd back the Second Amendment. And going past that, going into my own experiences in law enforcement, you never see the news articles of how many other women have to do the same thing when they're, they're being abused, um, whether or if they're being robbed in the streets, anything like that. So many other women and men as well have used the Second Amendment to protect themselves from terrible, terrible people. And it never hits the news. The only thing that hits the news is when it's when it's abused, and it's and it's abused by people that are doing it illegally anyway. So it's the, the Second Amendment. We we have to communicate to the immigrant communities and to everybody else, not just the Second Amendment, but all our amendments, uh, the Bill of Rights and the Constitution. They're not there um, to protect the government. They're there to protect us from the government and from each other. Quite frankly, so it's. We, we've got to do a better job of communicating to that people, to people telling these uncomfortable stories we don't want to tell, because quite frankly, I don't love talking about what I witnessed with my mom and my birth father. It's, it's, uh, it's not a fun conversation. It doesn't feel good, but we, we need to explain these things to people. We need to explain how our constitution is set up to help Americans succeed, live, and be great, to be anything they want. Matt, um, I mean, uh, in the future, I would love to host uh, some of those Second Amendment forums because I think it's extremely important as immigrants, we are educated uh, about these rights. I strongly believe in First Amendment, religious liberty, the Second Amendment. I mean, these are some of the fundamental God-given rights. Yes. Um, so Matt, let, let, I know you're a veteran, so and we do have sizable veteran community in Northern Virginia. Um, I'm not sure if I told you, I'm a healthcare professional, so I do hear a lot of gut-wrenching stories of veterans who have just been ignored or neglected. In fact, uh, I tried to put my son for an internship at Veteran Hospital, too, because I really wanted him to see what that, what that healthcare system looks like. And there is obviously government-run healthcare bureaucracy at VA hospitals. It resulted in delayed care for our servicemen and women, and in fact, sometimes resulting in premature and avoidable deaths. So if you are elected to represent our um, community that's in 11th Congressional District, what will you do to allow our veterans to have better access to health care and all of the services that they need and, and they deserve it? This is very near and dear to my heart also. And I want to say, based on a conversation I had recently with uh, Sang Yi, if anybody ever wants to get roasted by a fellow politician, call Sang Yi. I called him because I wanted advice, see how he does it in a Democrat-led um, area, how he continues to lead the way as a Republican, get reelected, and he's he's tough on you. Um, but he helped me find out a lot of stats. And I want to say it's 10% of Virginia's veterans are in our district right now, which is a pretty, pretty large number. Um, <clears throat> the, the veteran issue is so near and dear to me. I served one year in Iraq, three years in Afghanistan, six of my brothers have committed suicide because of a lack of care, because they felt like they were abandoned and there was nowhere for them to go. I personally and my campaign manager, Matt, have gone six plus months without getting appointments for therapy for our PTSD, for sleep apnea or other issues. We're both disabled veterans. The VA system is completely broken and needs, it needs fixed. I have been looking at so many issues for how we can do that, such as opening up 
um, private health care to veterans, giving them more options when you can't get into the VA, when these things are backed up. There's just, this is a conversation I'd love to have more with you offline too, with your healthcare experience. There's so many different things we can do for them from opening up the, the healthcare, because if anybody deserves not, not to do this for myself, but it's, it's for the people that out there that, you know, they feel alone, they can't get help. If anybody deserves the help, it's them because they've, they've given everything for this nation. There's, I can't tell you how many times I've escorted back flag draped coffins and I've seen gold star spouses. These families, they've given everything for America and they continue to do so for wars that our, our congressmen, our president don't understand that they, they keep voting for. They have no out of touch again. They have no, no understanding of what that loss is and they're doing nothing for the people that are out there fighting in it. So I want to I want to do everything I can to help them. And that, that extends past healthcare to home issues too, because our homeless veteran um, crisis in, in Nova and around is skyrocketing. Also, it's something we've got to we got to figure out quickly. And if you know veterans, they'll they'll we lived in connexes, um, little little boxes for six to twelve to eighteen months at a time. We'll live anywhere; it doesn't matter. But uh, they're they're being left on the streets right now to die and to to fall into addiction and other things. So we've got to we got to do something about it. Man, I'm glad we're addressing uh, addiction and uh, homelessness too. I think that those are such uh, veteran issues, which is kind of uh, shocking to me to imagine that uh, this could even happen in America. Uh, I read some articles saying that uh, people are showing uh, tremendously about what's happening in Ukraine cities. But if you go to San Francisco and Pittsburgh and DC, I mean, it is the same status. So we don't really talk about that, but we talk about um, things that are happening out there. Right. Um, uh, and Matt, I'll be offline too. We can definitely talk about it. That's kind of dear, uh, dear to me. I would love to kind of do anything to help them out. Uh, uh, Matt, I, I know you mentioned about post-traumatic stress disorder a couple of times uh, uh, while you were speaking to me. Is it an exaggeration on my side to say it's easy to get sex change surgery right now in America versus mental health care in veterans affairs? I think um, that, uh, that's it just mind blowing to me that there's so much discussion about that and so little discussion about this. What am I missing? I can give you another great story for that. You're absolutely right. The I, I thought about rejoining the military just a couple of years ago because um, I, I, I love serving. And I've, I've always wanted to be a pilot. I got my master's in aerospace engineering. I'm working on my private pilot license. And I was like, you know what? I should, I should go try and be a pilot. So I go and I, I talk to the recruiter. I do my paperwork for MEPS, the, uh, where, you, where you go, you do your physical and all that. And I put in that I was receiving um, te uh, testosterone injections from my doctor to maintain my, my normal levels of testosterone. And I got barred from reentry because I was using testosterone to maintain my normal levels as a man. And I was like, aren't, aren't y'all paying for transitions right now for people that want to transition between genders? And yeah, I'm like, okay. <laughs> I'm like, that, that just blew my mind. I'm, I'm taking these shots. They're not pleasant. If anybody out there takes testosterone shots, it doesn't feel good at all. And I'm doing it just to maintain my levels, to be me, to be normal. And I, I can't serve my country anymore. I served honorably for eight years, multiple conflicts, and I can't go back in because I take testosterone. But you could go in and you could change your gender completely. That's a problem. Matt, uh, I mean, these examples, uh, it's just mind blowing. Every single time I hear something like this, I can't help but just literally like, we need to really change our uh, the makeup of Congress and kind of have those young, energetic, realistic, military veterans, healthcare professionals, the teachers, policemen that really knows the jobs. Uh, Matt, something that you said kind of um, stinged me. Uh, you talked about um, uh, looking at a lot of coffins, taking care of um, your fellow men. And then these are the people that um, uh, our school system calls those kids privileged. And I think that really, really bothers me. Uh, I mean, I think they go through life traumatic experience when one of their parents goes uh, goes away for months at a stretch, if not years. So mm -hmm. uh, why is our education system such a wreck that we call them privileged? <laughs> How are they privileged? I mean, I know I don't belong to a military family, 
But where is our school system? How is it so broken that they can't realize that military kids have to go through a whole lot in their life than just an average kid like my kids who get up and go to work? We have two, two, um, a two parent family don't have to go through that. I think that's unacceptable. And I want to first point out that my wife and I are very blessed that our children have amazing teachers who have been deployed and abroad working in Afghanistan or as a police officer have been just extremely understanding and have worked with them because it is very hard on young kids. So first hat off to all the amazing teachers out there that are doing your best for our children and aren't doing what Shalik is saying here because that's sad. I, my daughter, when I, when I went on my, I wanna say second Afghanistan tour, um, she was really young and I, ca I came back and I was so happy to see her and I had a big beard and she, she was terrified of me. She didn't remember me. And uh, that was one of the saddest moments of my life. It took a few weeks for her to finally get used to me again and to want to wanna let me even hold her. That's, that's really hard as a dad and, you know, for her, for my wife or also. And as soon as she got used to me again, I was ready to go back into the civilian workforce and I shaved my beard and she forgot me again. So to act like these kids are so privileged, I, I don't know what privilege there is about your daddy or your mommy being gone for a year at a time, possibly dying, losing limbs. Um, I, I, don't, I don't see the privilege there. We're doing it for, for pennies because we love this country. And anymore, we're not even being sent to wars that are for this country, that are defending our own constitution. So I, I, fa I fail to see the privilege there. <laughs> I'd say it's a great privilege to serve this country, but anymore, that's not even what our what our government's having us do. I mean, that's a sad part. We're not fighting or we're not putting all of you through this for America First Agenda, too. I think that's even more reckoning to hear. So, Matt, let me talk to you about some more data. I mean, you in 11th Congressional District, it should be coming across as no surprise to you that we do have 800,000 people out of which close to uh, five to 150,000 folks are Asians, Blacks, African-Americans, uh, Hispanics, all minority communities. So um, are you doing any outreach community strategy to kind of engage and try to understand the issues within these communities, especially with, um, uh, I say, Asian-American hate is kind of talked a lot more in DC, but it kind of comes mm -hmm. to 11th Congressional District. And I'm very passionate about um, uh, Blacks too, like Somalians, Ethiopians, and obviously our Hispanic brothers and sisters. There are so many of them here. So any outreach strategy or outreach education that you're participating in? Right, I am. I, and I don't create the strategy. I'm just the guy that goes and talks to everybody. I've got a great team to do the, do the strategy for it. But so far, we've, we've done a lot of outreach. We've talked to the Ethiopian groups. Um, Latino groups, the Afghan groups. We've been out talking to all sorts of people and it's been great. Um, one of the Ethiopian groups I recently talked to, they provided me a lot of videos and stories about what's going on in their, their home country and the oppression that they've experienced. And it was foreign to me. I didn't know any of that. So we've got to get out more and talk to them. I've got to do a better job. I'm doing, and I am, I'm doing as much as I can. I'm going to do even more push as hard as I can to get out to these communities. Cause like you said, it's a majority. Um, there's so much that I didn't understand before that I'm, I'm learning now and it's, it's incredible. We've got to listen to these people. We've got to talk to them and we got to do what we can to help because they've been left behind by the Democrat party for sure. The party that claims to, to have their best interests in mind has done nothing for them. They're still suffering the same ways um, and we've, we've got to listen and we've got to help. I'm committed to doing that. Democrats only minority vote. I just don't think they care for the issues. I can tell you as an Asian American, I brought it to their attention, Asian American discrimination in TJ Coalition, and they mm -hmm. didn't think about it. In fact, they went in and endorsed uh, the current process of lottery system, which kind of uh, means that Asian American kids uh, percentage of getting into those schools have reduced drastically. So I know for sure they're really not doing much for uh, the communities. Yeah, they're, they're celebrating their, their victories in court against Asian Americans. So it's, uh, we, we need to make sure that people are recognizing that, that they're, they're against you, they're not for you. And, and we, need to, we need to fight hard. Absolutely. And Matt, I'm glad you are able to go into the communities and you're willing, you have the willingness to continue to do that. I think Definitely. that's what I've got a lot more to do. 
Excellent. So uh, I know that uh, you don't have to tell me your trade secrets by any means, but I'm always curious to know there are stronger candidates or strong candidates out there on the campaign trail. So what is your strategy for winning primaries? I mean, it's coming up in a few days. So do you have any specific strategies to ensure that your delegates indeed show up, uh, pick you as the first candidate? What, what is the strategy looking like for you at this point? So I've, I've been out of work the past two weeks and I've been 100% committed to this primary. And, you know, one thing I will say is I wish I, I stopped working earlier, but I, I told you my bills earlier, they're up there. So um, I'm calling delegates every day and the conversations I'm having with delegates are great. I don't call them and tell them, this is what I'm gonna do for you. I wanna, I call them and I'm like, I'm running to be your voice. What can I do for you? We have amazing conversations. I Pretty much every delegate I've picked that's picked up the phone for me, is voting for me and I love that. I appreciate it. If you're watching now, your support is your support for me is amazing. I I can't thank you enough. In addition to that, we've got some other things going out there like social media ads, mailers. Um, I think it's too late for anybody to jump on the mail train now, but we got on there. I I, I went a little different tactic with fundraising at the uh, the end of the quarter. I, I I loaned myself some money after the quarter so we could help out and get some better stuff out there. Um, instead of instead of fluffing the numbers right there at the end of the quarter, but we're we're doing really well with ads, and I think we're going to have a a tremendous showing on Saturday. I'm proud of my team for working so hard. I'm proud of the other teams too for working so hard on outreach, getting the voters out. Is that we've got to do that? We've got to get Republicans out to the polls and just get a lot of awareness on this race. And I and my team's done a great job at that. So thanks to all those guys and gals for for everything they're doing. Matt, I always say there's a lot of family time. So I know you have um, younger kids, so thank you for taking the time out of your personal schedule. You, cho you just could have just stayed back and let the country go to dumps, right? But you chose to kind of get in and do it. And Matt, you have some great endorsement. I saw two other guys, uh, one of them is a politician, the other person I believe is an activist endorsing you. Are they endorsing you because of the issues that you picked uh, or are you getting these great endorsements because uh, you just persuaded them? <laughs> uh, I, when I saw the endorsement, I said, wow, those are great endorsements. So um, uh, is that an issue? I mean, what discussions are you having with these guys? It's a, it's a combination of everything. They see my issues, they, they look at the websites, and then I've had a conversation with everybody that's endorsed me, a personal conversation, whether it be lunch, uh, a phone call. It's usually, it's usually in-person meetings, and it's usually not just one because these, these high-level endorsements aren't going to just put their name to you after talking to you for five minutes. They, they do a lot of betting. It's serious to them. Um, so some of those endorsements I've got are U.S. Rep. Barry Moore of Alabama, Morton Blackwell, the Leadership Institute, our SEC Rep. Richard McCarty, Delegate Candidates Matt Lang and Julie Perry, um, <clears throat> Dr. Harry Jackson, a great school board activist who was attacked by Steve Descano, another guy we're going to get out of here soon. And then I added two more this week. Um, and sorry if I missed anybody. My list is actually getting pretty high. But this week we added a conservative powerhouse down in Florida, Anthony Sabatini. And I didn't have to have as many conversations with Anthony because we grew up together. So he, he knows me really well. He, we served together in the Army. Uh, we went to school together. And we've, we've been pro-America, America first since we were probably five years old, since we could understand what America was. Um, so that was, that was a relatively easy one. We're both, he's going for Congress now. He's trying to leave the Florida house to, to go federal and keep fighting. And he's, if you followed him and he's done great things for Florida. So I'm really looking forward to what he does in Congress also. And then we added um, Ron Wilcox of the Nova Tea Party. And funny, funny you should mention that. I'll, I'll read something to you from Ron real quick because they tried to hit Ron with the article today also. Do you know who you're supporting? <laughs> and Ron's response, which you'll be putting out, <clears throat> I'll read it for you. It's a, it's a good one. If I can find it. That's okay. Take your time. <laughs> Yes, so Ron says, I've, remeared, I've reviewed the smear article against Matthew Chapel and found, them, found it to be without merit. Matthew has had several current and former reputable law enforcement officers come out in support of him and to slam the defamation against him. 
Glenn County's former administration has a longstanding history of targeting and destroying the careers of good law enforcement officers. Furthermore, the new Glenn County Police Chief has already agreed to completely review Matthew's file for discrepancies. The fake news already knew this and still chose to publish a hit. Publish a hit. So he's standing by me. Every, all my endorsements are aware of this smear campaign and they're standing by me and we're just gonna, we're gonna take this thing all the way to November and knock Jerry Connolly out no matter what he throws. Got a strong team, strong endorsements, strong family. We will not be stopped. Absolutely, Matt. When the endorsement, they're putting their reputation at integrity. So they must really believe and trust you. So, which is amazing. So Matt, I know you want to go and start cooking for your daughters. I don't want to keep you any longer than you should be here. But in the Promise last- to cook them burgers. <laughs> no, good for you. I will never, I always say family comes first. That's one of our value that we have in common. So I'll not be in your way at all. Well, but before you leave in the last uh, one or two minutes, please let me know if I missed anything. You addressed education. I think I know exactly where you stand, stand with education. I understand that you do understand about Biden inflation right now. I mean, there are many more things that I could talk about, about transportation, but you are very passionate about veteran community. You clarified about your law enforcement uh, officer position at Georgia. What, what, what else would you like to tell your uh, viewers that are watching right now and they tend to watch later on? We tend to usually have hundreds and thousands of views later on. I would love for you to make a final appeal to them and also talk about your website or how to donate, volunteer, call, email you, and so on and so forth. Well, everybody that's come out and watched me speak knows that I, I try to be a short-winded politician. I don't like to put people to sleep too much, but my website is chapelforcongress.com. It's C-H-A-P-P-E-L-L -L for congress.com. You'll find a list of my issues on there. Um, you can also reach out to me through, through the link there. We'll get an email and it comes directly to my inbox. And I, I talk to everybody. Anybody that emails me, calls me, I talk to you. So my, my goal in this to be your representative is to be your voice. It's not all about me. I've got my opinions. This is one of the things I've been trying to put out there. My opinion on, on uh, America, the America first thing, staying out of Ukraine, unless it's a total NATO mission, isn't always popular with people. But I like to remind everybody it's my opinion. And I'm not running to be a ruler like Jerry Connolly. I'm running to represent the voice of the people to put your voice, your issues, your opinions in Congress. So I want everybody, whether you disagree or agree with me to talk to me and tell me I'm my ears are open all the time. And my number one goal is to serve you as I always have. So please come out May 7th, reach out, email me, call me. We could talk about anything. I look forward to seeing everybody, whether you've decided already that I'm your number one or your number two, I just look forward to seeing everybody talking and serving this great country as best I can. Matt, thank you so much for joining us. This was a wonderful conversation and I wish you the very best in primaries. I thank, thank you, you for coming on board to clarify some things and also explain your position on issues that really matter to 11th Congressional District constituents. I'm one, your, one of your constituents, so I my ears perk up when candidates such as you are talking. If you are the chosen candidate, I hope you come by and uh, come by again to conversations that count. Definitely, definitely. We can deep dive into many issues that we didn't get a chance to talk about, which I know are plaguing our country. And I wish to talk to you after the primaries are over on how to mutually work together to help our veteran communities. Fairfax GOP is very committed to our military and veteran families. And I wish we would do more for them in our county. So I thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me. A couple of announcements, viewers. You've seen Matt. He's putting his time, talent, and treasure out there. Um, his website is up and running. He's available. So please um, talk to him, discuss any concerns, suggestions, and questions that you have. Uh, very open to ideas. So I look forward to seeing all of you on May 7th um, when we have this uh, primary is going on. I also would like to say that May is Asian American Month. In lieu of that, I have invited Z Van Fleet on Friday, May 6th at 5 p.m. Z, for those of you that don't know, Z actually lives in um, Loudoun County. She grew up in Maoist China and spent her entire school years in Maoist Cultural Revolution. She came to United States at in 1986 as a student to pursue her graduate studies. She was compelled by her personal experience during this Chinese Cultural Revolution. And uh, she came to the realization that she's been experienced, whatever she experienced there is happening right here in America. So she has committed herself to one 
on us, American people, and help all of us clearly see what is happening in America. I hope all of you can tune in to listen to her personal story and her alignment of what happened then to what is happening in America right now. I promise it will be a wonderful, wonderful uh, show. On Saturday, you will see, uh, you will also hear from Captain Cow. He is uh, uh, running in 10th Congressional District. So I hope you tune in for that as well. As again, as I said, God bless Matt, his family, and God bless you all. I hope you're enjoying these insightful conversations as much as I am enjoying hearing from candidates and uh, talking to you all. God bless America and see you again on Friday. Thank you. Thank you so much.